Welcome to the Solid Verbal. The Solid Verbal. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! I've heard so many players say, well, I want to be happy. You want to be happy for a day? Eat a steak. It's that woo woo! And now, Dan and Ty. Welcome back to the Solid Verbal, boys and girls. My name is Ty Hildenbrand. Dan Rubenstein actually not joining me this evening. Uh, I got the week off last week. And so it's only fair that Dan would take his turn this week. He will be back with me next week, I promise. But in the meantime, it was my duty to go out and find an esteemed guest to bring on the show. As you know, a week ago, Dan interviewed our friend Bruce Feldman, one half of the Audible podcast. So this week, why not continue the trend? I'm going to bring Stuart Mandel, the other half of the Audible podcast, back on the show It's been a a long time, actually, since we had Stu on the podcast, and that's not for any reason. We love Stu. It just hasn't worked out. And in case you didn't know, he's also been a very, very busy man. He has now become the front man for the All-American, which is part of the athletics push into sports media, more specifically college football. So Stu's been a busy guy. I want to talk to him about that. I want to talk to him about some other topical college football items that some folks have emailed in about over the last week or so. And also, I put out a call on Twitter a short while ago to get some questions for him. And we'll talk about some of those as well. I also may have a surprise for everyone at the end of the podcast. So make sure you listen the full way through. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, Anywhere where you can find podcasts, because we really, truly have a lot going on over the next couple of months. Got a new website, Cooking in the Oven. Dan's working on some new shirts. We've got a live show in the works in Chicago in early to mid-August. And j- just make sure you keep in touch over the next couple of months, because we're really excited about what lies ahead. And if you like and listen to the show, we know you will be, too. Without further ado, let's talk to our friend Stuart Mandel from The All-American and The Athletic. All right, joining me now, an esteemed guest of the program. His name is Stuart Mandel. You know him from The All-American on The Athletic family of sports websites. Stu, how are you? Great, Ty. How are you? I'm doing well. You've been a busy guy since the last time we had you on the show. Yeah, it's uh, it's a much busier role that I've taken on now where I'm both writing and managing an entire enterprise, but it's a good kind of busy. All right. Talk me through this because what was it last year? Fox Sports decides rather infamously that they're going to try this whole pivot to video thing that leaves you that leaves a bunch of other talented individuals kind of on the outside looking in. You're in this place where you've obviously got a lot of name recognition within the college football community, among college football fans. Presumably, you're like looking for a steady source of income like the rest of us. What what happens next? Well, so the Fox Pivot to Video didn't become public until late June of last year. Right. But we, myself, Bruce Feldman, we knew about it. We knew that's where it was headed. Nobody had outwardly come out and said, like, you guys won't have a place to write. But we knew that was where it was headed probably from mid-January. So I'd had a lot of time to, you know, both think about what I wanted to do next and obviously start talking to people. And then in the course of that, I think it was late April, ESPN had their massive layoffs. SI laid off a bunch of good people. Um, and it was just it was so depressing in our industry at that time. It felt like the, the whole thing was just dying. Man. And I just kept saying to myself, it doesn't make any sense. There's still a huge demand for what we do. People are voraciously consuming written sports journalism. If Fox or ESPN or whoever can't figure out how to make a good business model out of that, like somebody else should. And fortuitously, that's what The Athletic was starting to do at that time. Now, at that time, they were only in a few local markets. They hadn't really um, attempted to do anything on a national level. But they saw an opportunity. Uh, they talked to Seth Davis for that college basketball site as soon as he became available. And then it was just a lot of good fortune in that. I live here in the Bay Area. They're based in San Francisco. 
I had already really started sketching out what a college football vertical would look like. It's something that myself and Dan Uthman, who's our managing editor who came from USA Today, had kind of talked about in theory for a long time. And when I was going through my transition, if you will, period, uh, I really started putting more thought into it. So it all came together very quickly because it's something I was already thinking about. It's something this company was already heading toward. And it all, um, you know, next thing I knew, I went from writing, doing much the same thing I've been doing for my whole career to getting hired and then immediately turning around and start hiring other people. So is it fair to say that you're the front man of, of this operation? Were you a front man in your band in college, by the way? <laughs> no, that that's, uh, I was the guitarist and I kind of consciously avoided being the front man. Did, you, did you secretly want to be the front man back then? Well, I think everybody, whether they're, whether they're in a band or not, right? Everybody fantasizes about being the lead singer, the front man, the front man, the the ultimate rock star. Yeah. But I was also very, very much aware of the fact that I could not sing to save my life. So (laughs) it was never, it was never really a realistic option. In this case, you can write and you do have some degree of credibility within the college. I I was just thinking Eddie Van Halen may be the only guitarist who's the actual front man of a, or the most recognized person from a band. But anyway, um, it's not just the writing. I just, I've been, you know, well, I've been writing and also just kind of being part of um, college football on the internet and the digital space, basically almost since the start of the internet, since the late 90s. And I feel like I had a pretty good pulse of what fans want, what's worked for me over the years. Um, Increasingly, we've seen the direction some sites are going in that I frankly just kind of could tell anecdotally, like people are kind of turned off by this. People are turned off by autoplay videos. Why do you guys keep doing it? And so that's why I really like the athletics approach. Um, and I, I guess I did have kind of an entrepreneurial spirit. Like every so often I would always have like kind of uh, harebrained business ideas in my head that I just never quite followed through on. Um, this one obviously is one where you actually, where I could actually bring something to the table, uh, have that, um, I think the startup lingo is what's your unfair advantage. And I guess my unfair advantage was just having a lot of experience and a lot of relationships built up in this space. And, and a lot of pop punk and emo knowledge, right? To boot. Yeah, you, you know, that hasn't really come in handy in this new job yet, but hopefully soon. Do you find that you're watching a lot more Shark Tank now that you're officially an entrepreneur? I think the thing that, not Shark Tank. I mean, it, being in Silicon Valley, obviously. I mean, I was watching the show Silicon Valley before, right. <laughs> uh, long before I was involved with this company. But this this season has just felt so much different. It's just, you know, it's real life now. And then, you know, I don't think this is a coincidence. Have you ever heard the Gimlet podcast startup? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I listened to that probably within a few months of when I first kind of got aware of uh, the athletic. So when I had those first conversations with the founders, I could at least speak a little bit of their lingo, uh, a little bit of startup speak. It's, um, it's cool. I, I find that I really enjoy much more than I would have imagined uh, the business side of it. And it's actually taken up a lot more of my time than I would have guessed. Yeah. Like I just kind of naively thought, okay, we'll get the thing up and running. Uh, Dan Uthman is the guy who actually does the day-to-day editing of the stories and coordinating with the writers. I'll just be a writer that happens to have an editor in chief title, but no, like there's so many, uh, from a strategic standpoint, from an operation standpoint, there's so many things that come up on a day to day basis. And now we're hiring again. So, uh, it's just like last summer all over again. I spent, find myself spending a lot of time on the phone with uh, prospective candidates. Let, let me play devil's advocate for a second, because you talked a little bit about what the fans want. I think, there, there's always going to be someone out there covering college football for free. And I, I guess I should say probably because we don't know where this whole thing is headed 10 years from now. But I guess my point is, is, is a subscription model sustainable? It's, ama- it's sustainable. And what's amazing is how quickly it's become normalized. Uh, when, we, when we got this thing off the ground a year ago, they, yeah, I mean, there was still a whole lot of why would I pay for this? You know, you guys are crazy. You're so many places you can get this for free. And I noticed that when um, Seth Emerson, our new Georgia writer, started in mid-April, uh, he came from the AJC, from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. 
And I had told him, you know, when you tweet out that you're coming to The Athletic and that people are going to now have to pay to read you, you're going to get a bunch of snarky tweets. Just be prepared for that. And he really didn't. You know, it was really in that short amount of time, people have come to kind of accept that, you know what? Yeah, I mean, that's what we do now. We pay for good, good not just sports writing. I mean, a lot of newspapers are now going to a much harder paywall. Um, I just saw Bloomberg is, is going to be doing one. Vanity Fair is doing one. And so what we're seeing is, you're right, there will always be free um, sports writing out there. I don't, I don't disagree with that notion. But I think where we're headed, and I don't know how many years this will take, it's going to be the same model, much the same model you see in TV, where if I wanted to, I could just watch ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox for free, and they have TV on around the clock, right? But theoretically, I don't need any more than that. But most people pay extra for cable, and then a lot of people pay extra on top of that for HBO, Netflix, um, Amazon Prime, things that are doing what is considered to be um, you know, high-quality TV. And that's... That's where we have to distinguish ourselves. It has to be really high quality journalism that's worth paying for. The two factors that really seem to be disrupting the business of college football are A, attendance is dropping, and B, we've got this whole cord cutting thing going on where it seems as if that's accelerating as well. Now that you're kind of in the business of sports media on a couple different fronts, where are we at 10 years from now? How, how do you think the landscape will have changed? in the way that the game is covered, in the way that consumers go out there and get their college football media? Well, I, the attendance thing is fascinating to me because uh, Michael Weinreb wrote a story for us about, I guess, a month ago now on, on it. And, and he was, it was started with his kind of firsthand account of his, his own parents, who were longtime Penn State season ticket holders, who, who decided they'd had enough and canceled and the response we got to that story, not just in terms of how many people read it, but the comments and the emails and the tweets of people saying, ah, same thing, I'm fed up, I've had enough with the, it costs so much to park and it takes forever to get there or the, the concessions are terrible or whatnot, you know, all getting back to, I'm going to stay home and watch it in HD on my TV. So I think colleges have a real problem there and I don't think they've even begun to uh, figure out how to deal with that in terms of cord cutting. You know, it'll be fascinating the next time um, uh, all these conference deals come up. And I don't think it's going to be for another five or six years. But once the first one comes up, which I think is the either the Pac-12 or the next uh, Big Ten deal, they all come up within a three or four year span. And who knows who the players will be? You know, I'm sure ESPN will still be a major player and Fox will still be a major player. But so will Netflix. So will Amazon. So might uh, Facebook and Twitter who will be actually winning the rights to those contracts. You know, I think, um, I think we can't really say right now. Well, and the question I guess next is, does that sort of jockeying for rights lead to any kind of expanded playoff or any kind of conference alignment, conference realignment? Well, we just, it's, it's crazy. I mean, cord cutting has accelerated, you know, so quickly that we're only, we're not that far removed from the last, crazy realignment cycle of 20 or, you know, what, 2010, 2011, 2012. People talk about it like it was a blizzard or an earthquake, right? Yeah. And, but also the main or one of the main reasons behind it was cable households. You know, the big 10 wanted Rutgers so they could add to the big 10 network cable households. And, you know, when Larry Scott tried to make that huge play for the big 12 teams, it was when he was starting the Pac-12 network. And I say that because by the time that next round comes up, that might not be a factor at all. Um, that might be in a completely outdated uh, metric. How many cable households do you have? So um, I, it, it could go one of two ways. It could be that everybody just says, we're, we're happy the way we are. We frankly, in some cases, went a little too far last time. Um, we're, we got 14 team conferences. That's a really awkward number. So that's the, the moderate end. But it could also be pretty radical. And I've written about this. In a, in, a, in a world where you're not bound by cable households and geographic footprint and whatnot, what's to stop Ohio State, USC, Michigan, Texas, Alabama, et cetera, from forming their own confederation, their own okay. Champions League, if you will, right. and marketing that product nationally? Because right now... You know, it's just kind of a 
uh, accepted practice. It's been this way for a hundred years that Ohio State, whatever, you know, 100,000 seat stadium, massive TV audience, and all that gets shared with Purdue. Um, at some point, aren't they going to say like, wait a minute, wait, we should be keeping this money to ourselves. Who, who so starts that though? Made. Who starts that? Is that, is that something that athletic directors band together and form on the sly or where does that come from? Yeah, I mean, it, it can't, you know, it's obviously, obviously probably not going to come from conference commissioners who want to keep their conferences <laughs> yeah. intact. And those tend to be the most powerful figures in our sport. Jim Delaney not dialing that one up. I think it would come from, uh, frankly, I think it would come from external factors. I think it would come from a TV executive somewhere coming to approaching the schools preemptively and saying, you know, hey, what, what would you guys think about this? Here's how much money we would pay you for this. Um, it may be, things move very slowly in college sports. So even though we're still talking about something that's eight or nine years away, maybe that's still too soon. I don't know. Um, and there's other things that will influence that. Will the rules about paying athletes change between now and then? Cause if so, um, that's going to give those schools extra incentive to make more revenue and, and frankly, keep more of it for themselves. Um, uh, cause they're the ones that are going to have the most, um, marketable athletes. Well, specifically now with college football's off season, do you have a favorite story that you've been following so far? I know that every year in this time of year, certainly in the spring, we're, we're focused on quarterback competitions. So that's not necessarily novel, but these are some really unique ones. I mean, to go into a season where the defending national champions have a competition between the guy who's taken them to two straight national title games and the guy who came in the second half and won it. I mean, that's that's crazy. <laughs> right. Clemson, their their quarterback, Kelly Bryant, takes them to the playoff the year after Deshaun Watson leaves. And now he's fighting to save his job from the next hot shot freshman. Same thing at Georgia. These are, you know, these are high profile programs with with um, very unusual circumstances, right? Usually when a school has a quarterback competition, it's the the well Clemson last year, right? Deshaun Watson leaves. Who's going to be the next guy to replace Deshaun Watson? This is the guy who's already proven he can replace Deshaun Watson is competing for his job against the next guy. Um, th- those stories all fascinate me. The Shea Patterson thing to me at Michigan is, is sort of fascinating because I think much like at Florida, where it's always felt like they were a quarterback away from getting to a different level. I think the same thought almost applies to Michigan. And now Shea Patterson moves up from Ole Miss. He, of course, wins the ruling. He's eligible immediately. There's either an assumption that he can take Michigan to some new height or that they're going to be stuck in this third place vein in the Big Ten East. And it's not going to mean anything. Jim Harbaugh is going to wear out his welcome and it's all going to go bust. I think that's, I mean, I think you're right. I think that's kind of the stakes that are about to play out. This is, this is the no excuses season. Now he has a quarterback. We've seen him. We've seen Shea Patterson uh, play at a very high level in the sec. He is without question upgrade from what they've had. And, and, and that's not to say that um, Brandon Peters couldn't eventually develop into that kind of player, but I don't, you know, I just find it hard to imagine he's going to come out and beat out Shea Patterson. So I mean, offensive line is still a big question mark for them. It has been for seemingly um, many, many years now. But they have the quarterback. They have good receivers, good running backs, great defense. And so you're right. I mean, if it's ever going to happen for Harbaugh, it would, you would think it would be this year. And yet you look at that schedule, and it is absolutely not set up for a breakthrough 13-win um, no, kind of season. Not it's an all. absolutely brutal schedule. And they could be a better team and still go 9-3. and three. And obviously, people like those Ohio State fans, unless they have just beaten Ohio State in that, um, will be mocking him for being the $9 million coach that can't uh, finish higher than third. Do you think that Harbaugh is truly wearing out his welcome at Michigan? Because there were rumblings towards the end of last year that that was already starting to take place. And uh, that was kind of his MO at other stops that he'd been. I mean... You're always going to have that fringe in the message boards on MGO blog who aren't happy and, and want to go on to the next guy. But right. I think the bigger picture, uh, reasonable people know how much he succeeded at his previous stops, how fortunate they were to get him, and that it would be kind of ridiculous to blow the thing up after four years, you know, just like you did with Brady Hope, just like you did with Rich Rod. Like at some point, you got to 
you got to pick a guy and stick with him. Now, I've been watching some of that Michigan documentary, and you could see you could, you can absolutely see where he his act would get old at some point. Yeah. He's well, got a lot of a lot of cheesy dad cliches to say the least. <laughs> but I didn't sense, and I know it's just an edited down product. You're not seeing everything, but I didn't get any sense that the players had tuned out on him or anything like that. They just uh, so many of their problems last year were 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 because of that quarterback situation. So. Um, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out this year. I'm not, um, he's not on the hot seat. He's not going to get fired if they go eight and four next year, but I'm also not naive enough to think that, you know, uh, Michigan, nothing offends Michigan fans more than the, than anybody who dares to suggest that he would go back to the NFL. Right. You know, come on, don't be naive. Like people have blown off their alma maters under d- plenty of circumstances and, if he feels like he's worn out his welcome, then certainly that's a possibility. I personally have enjoyed following the trip to France. And maybe not for the reasons you'd expect. You can't avoid it if you read about college football in the offseason, especially not now. Because if you go on like ESPN.com, there are at least 15 Michigan logos in their news feed about what's <laughs> going on on their trip abroad. But there's part of me, we've been making fun of, of Harbaugh on this show for a long time. And not because he doesn't win, not because he's obviously a great coach, but it, he's just, he's always had this awkward quality to him. And I find it amusing because I think that awkward quality probably plays well in a country that doesn't natively speak English. Well, first of all, I'm experiencing this a little differently, I think, than you are. I, I you know, I definitely remember following every minute of that Italy trip last year. <laughs> and this That's one, right. That's right. I forgot they went to Italy. Yeah, this one just kind of snuck up on me. Like, oh, that's right. He did say they were going to go to France, didn't he? Right. And I think that's a sign of, you know, how much interest people have lost in that program from last year to this that's year true. after an eight and five season. But um, you're probably, yeah, I think you're right about that. I mean, French, there's nothing more awkward than French humor, right? Right, exactly. Like, trying, to, trying to figure out, and I've been there many times, trying to figure out what they're going to find funny. Um, they probably think he's hilarious. Exactly. That's my point. All right. Uh, let's talk about the SEC because another big offseason story has obviously been the coaching turnover. You had Jimbo Fisher, Jeremy Pruitt, Joe Moorhead, Dan Mullen, Chad Morris, Matt Luke. You've also got some assistant hires, top flight assistant hires, and Mike Elko at AM and John Chavis at Arkansas, Josh Gaddis stolen away from. My alma mater, Penn State, now coaching wide receivers at Bama. What is your sense for how the conference shakes out this year? And I ask that not because I don't already assume that Alabama is going to be the top dog, but whenever you've got a situation like this in a premier conference with so many new coaches, that always tends to be ripe for a bunch of surprises. Do you you think we see a surprise out of any of those programs? Yeah, I I think you almost have to because... You know, you look at the draft this past weekend, and once again, the SEC had the most players taken. And that's despite the fact that if you were to, you know, recap the SEC last season, it was three teams. It was Alabama, Georgia, and Auburn. Those were really good teams, the the first two more so than Auburn, though Auburn beat both of them. Um, But they didn't produce all those NFL players. Florida still had guys taken. LSU still had guys taken. So we know there's the know that you know the talents there. And some schools needed a new coach. So, you know, I put in my um, post-spring top 25, I just took a flyer on Florida. Uh, why not? They, I feel like last season, they just, it just, and their season ended about halfway through the year when, when all the awkwardness of Jim McElwain and the death threats and like once that happened, they just, it just seemed like they threw in the towel. It wasn't, but it wasn't still, so much like a defined ending as much as it just stopped. People stopped paying attention. Yeah, it just like, dropped off a cliff. They, yeah, like people watched the Florida-Tennessee game. I remember watching the Kentucky game where Kentucky completely blew it. <laughs> um, and then by the Georgia game, it was just like, all right, we've had enough of them. And Florida, Florida and Florida State played a football game last year, and I'm not sure anybody saw it outside of the stadium. So anyway, I think they could be a much improved team. We, we know, you know, unlike a, a Jeremy Pruitt, who's a first-time head coach, or, or even uh, Joe Moorhead, who's a first-time head uh, first time SEC or first time FBS head coach, we know what we're getting with Dan Mullen. So I could, I could see that team having uh, success right off the bat. I could see A&M with Jimbo Fisher doing that to some degree, though. Quarterback's a, a question there. And also, much like um, we talked about with Michigan, A&M plays Clemson and Alabama the fir- in the first four weeks of the season. That's rough. 
So I, I don't know. Florida could be that surprise team. A and M could be that surprise team. I do. I really like Mississippi State, um, but they're not a total surprise. They were a top twenty-five team last year. So right. you know, I think it'll be. I do think it'll be a little deeper than last year. Maybe Alabama is still dominant, and maybe even Georgia too. But maybe a little bit more of a middle class, which just was not in that. Which that conference just didn't have last year. Hey everyone, just a quick note to remind you that today's show is brought to you in part by our good friends over at ZipRecruiter. Every business needs great new people and an even better way to find them. So forget about posting your job online and just praying the right people find it. ZipRecruiter has that smarter way. They built a whole platform around it that helps find the right job candidates for you. They know what you're looking for. They identify people with the right experience. They invite them to apply to your job proactively. These invitations have revolutionized the way you find your next hire. 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get quality candidates through the site in just one day. They don't just stop there. They even spotlight the strongest applications you receive so you never miss a great match. All the right candidates are out there, and ZipRecruiter knows exactly how to find them. Right now, our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free absolutely free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash solid. That is ZipRecruiter.com slash solid. ZipRecruiter.com slash solid. Try it for free. It is the smartest way to hire. Tonight's show is also brought to you by our good friends over at Casper, a sleep brand that we've talked about time and time again here on the show. They continue to revolutionize their line of products to create an exceptionally comfortable sleep experience one night at a time. They now have three mattress models. They've got the original Casper, the Wave, and the Essential. All of their mattresses are perfectly designed to soothe and cradle your natural geometry. Not to mention, they've all got a breathable design, which help you sleep cool and regulate your body temperature all throughout the night. It's delivered right to your door in an amazing how-did-they-do-that size box. It really is pretty incredible. Free shipping, free returns in the United States and Canada as well. But the best part is that you can be sure of your purchase because they've got a 100 night, 100 night risk free trial. So sleep on it, live your life, see if you like it. 100 nights risk free from our friends at Casper. You spend one third of your life sleeping, might as well do it in as comfortable a fashion as possible possible i have one i love it dan has one he loves it as well the unboxing experience was cool sleeping on it is even better right now you get 50 bucks towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash verbal use verbal at checkout that is casper.com slash verbal your offer code is verbal you will get 50 bucks off your mattress purchase terms and conditions do apply as a West Coast guy now, you got you to gotta talk to me about Chip Kelly because, first off, Dan and I have debated for a couple weeks and months now about what we think the new Chip Kelly system is going to look like at UCLA. But furthermore, I got to say, after he left Oregon to go to the NFL, and then after it very clearly was going south in the NFL, it just felt like people in college football circles were talking endlessly about when would Chip Kelly go back to the college game? Now that he's there, I don't know if it's because there were so many other high-profile coaching moves this offseason or what. It almost feels to me like it hasn't gotten enough press. No, there's a reason for that. He has he has completely shut off access to himself and that program. He has not allowed a single uh, Bruce Feldman or Andy Staples or whoever to come do a sit-down interview with him. He has, um, I don't know if the assistants have either. There's just, you know... You think, oh, UCLA, LA, major media market. Well, they always get kind of second fiddle treatment to begin with to USC. And if you can't talk to anybody there, then they're going to get no treatment. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure that's by design. Um, I know that they're probably not going to have a very good team this year. Maybe he's tempering expectations a little bit. But you know, he's not, he's not out there doing the booster circuit by any means. So all that does is add mystery to it. I, I'm as fascinated as the next person to see um, what what Chip Kelly, college Chip Kelly 2.0 looks like, I think we'll probably see, 
you know, at its core, it'll still be the Oregon offense, but with a lot of NFL influence thrown in there. I still think it was um, the home run hire. Whoever would end up getting him would be making the home run hire of this past coaching carousel. And UCLA won those sweepstakes. And I think they'll do well, but I don't think it'll be uh, an instant um, instant impact kind of thing. Like when he got to Oregon and Dennis Dixon was already there and Jonathan Stewart was already there and, and he had a lot of success right off the bat. So you think you would rate Chip Kelly to UCLA higher than someone like Jimbo Fisher to A&M? Yeah, because Chip Kelly is... Um, and so much of it is about, I mean, the, the whole Jimbo to A&M thing still feels a little weird to me. I, I'm sure I'll get over it at some point, <laughs> but he has no, he has no ties whatsoever to there. Uh, they're paying him $25 million. Right. It's, have you noticed that this off season, whenever they show Jimbo Fisher, he's wearing like a, a blazer and a, and a button down shirt that's unbuttoned at the top. So you can like, it's, he's getting paid all that money now. How are you going to spend? Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not. I'm not trying to make any bold predictions here, but no, I mean, I think Chip Kelly is unique. He's one of the most innovative coaches that we've seen come through. And generally speaking, those guys, those guys, it's not lightning in a bottle. They're able to do it again at the next stop. You know, Chris Peterson is a good example. You know, right. one of the, one of the great coaches in this sport, in this era. And he found, you know, if, if Chris Peterson had gone to, Alabama, would he have the same kind of success he had at Boise? I don't know. I, it's hard, impossible for me to picture him in the SEC. But when it was Washington, I remember everybody felt like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And Chip Kelly back in the Pac-12. Because remember, Florida fans thought they had him. They, Chip Kelly, Florida coach, done deal. Right. And I kept saying, I don't know. I don't know if he wants to go there. He, he probably wants to be in the, in the Pac-12 if he can. And, and that's what happened. So it's a good spot for him. I don't, I don't think he'll be instant impact because it's going to take him a little bit to build up his program. I think the Jimbo thing is interesting because he actually has a lot of youth that he can work with. But the two in particular, we talked about Joe Moorhead in Mississippi State. We just think, I and on this show anyway, we've talked about how we think that's a really good schematic fit. But I think Scott Frost in Nebraska is potentially the situation I'm most interested in because you know that's a hungry fan base looking to restore the glory. They bring back a former player who clearly wanted to be there. It does seem like he's making a pretty big impact right away. Yeah, and you know what? I'm going to take back what I said earlier. Chip is the 1A to Scott Frost at Nebraska as the, as the number one home run hire of this past offseason. And that's very specific to that. It's just, it's such act. a good fit. Yeah, it's the perfect fit. It's, and frankly, one that I didn't know he for sure that he would do. I mean, it turned out after the fact that he it was a done deal for weeks. No. But at the time... There was a lot of, well, I don't know. He might feel like he has a better chance to win national championships at Florida. And he might opt for Florida over Nebraska. But he went home and he's, I mean, the excitement is off the charts. There's, you know, I, I know several writers who went to Nebraska this spring. They said there's 40 to 50 reporters at every spring practice. It's, it's the, in, people cannot get enough uh, about Scott Frost and the Huskers right now. Uh, how good are they going to be this coming season? You know, I think. They have. They certainly have a better talent on hand than than UCLA does right now, but it's not um, top twenty five quite yet. But uh, that'll happen pretty soon, and he's going to give them an identity. They're going to be basically the Oregon of the Midwest, and that's something that Nebraska has been lacking uh, for this entire century. I mean, basically since they went away from the triple option, which was their hallmark. What has the identity of Nebraska football been? I mean, for <laughs> for the only thing I could come up with is for a while there was the screaming madman on the sidelines. That was yeah. what people knew most about Nebraska football. So that was a great hire. Um, and that, you know, I think that took me a little bit by surprise that it, that it did end up happening. But now that it did, um, you know, you're definitely seeing, seeing it pay off. Do you have a general sense for the direction of the big 12 this year? Cause it feels like there's a lot of turnover. I think it feels a little bit more wide open for a simple reason. Baker Mayfield's gone and Bob Stoops for that matter. You know, I, I'm sure. not taking anything away from Lincoln Riley, but you know, now's when, when the real challenge for him begins life after the number one pick. So, you know, it, they've, they've dominated that conference for the last three years when they had this um, transcending quarterback. And so does that open the door this year? If, if, if they have a, a step back and I, think that's inevitable how much of a step back i don't know but the unrealistic kyler murray will come in and 
and do all the things Baker Mayfield did. If that, does that open the door for a West Virginia, for a TCU, who I'm really high on, a Kansas State? I don't think Texas is ready to contend for a Big 12 title yet, but I am interested to see what kind of progress they make. Do I understand correctly that you're not gung-ho on Florida State? Well, I, did, I, I didn't have them in the spring top 25, if that's right. what you're referring to. I had them just outside of it. Um, and and that was actually, let me think for a second. I think I had them in the one in January because there was this expectation that, um, you know, Jimbo had punted on the last part of that season. And and once they get DeAndre, basically it was like once they get DeAndre Francois back, they'll be in much better shape. But it turns out DeAndre Francois was selling drugs. And I don't know who the quarterback's going to end up being there, but that that did not, you know, that was not exactly the best sign for Willie Taggart's uh, first team at Florida State. Do you like the hire, though, of Willie Taggart at Florida State? I do. Um, I think he's a good coach. Obviously, his his career has taken off. Great recruiter. And again, it's one of those things where Willie Taggart to Oregon was kind of random in terms of which school. I mean, he was going to go to a Power 5 school, but he really had no uh, ties to that part of the country. But he grew up a big FSU fan. He you know, was just coaching in that state two years ago. So that hire makes sense for a lot of reasons. All right. My final question here, two questions actually for you. We got one on Twitter from Andy Staples, and he poses a very interesting dilemma. Some 41 and Newfound Glory are playing at the same time, but different venues. Which one of those two shows do you attend? Assuming you can't make it to both. Yeah, I saw that, and I got to be honest. So I, I was a huge pop punk fan in the days, but certain bands have, have um, remained in my memory more than others. And I have to say, when I saw his tweet... It's like I hadn't thought of some 41. I didn't forgotten some 41 existed until that tweet. That they they are so far off the radar for me. But I do still love Newfound Glory, so that wouldn't be very that wouldn't be a tough choice at all. I went back and listened to Fat Lip. That's funny. So did I. Into Deep. A few of those songs that you can get pretty quickly on Spotify. It doesn't hold up, does it? No, no, they no. Really no. It really don't hold up the way that it was I, just that one album, right? I remember being totally taken by all killer, no filler. And then years later to go back and listen to it, newfound glory, their stuff had much more staying power. Yeah. And I can't really explain why that is, but you're absolutely right. Um, a band that, that gets no credit in that era. And they may have been toward the tail end of that era is something corporate. Oh yeah. If you, if you listen to them now, like that could be a popular band right now. Some forty one probably would not get a record deal. Well, you're you're also pretty into the whole Taylor Swift thing. Well, that's the thing. As you get older, you you become lazy and <laughs> you're not really like actively seeking out music the way you were when you were nineteen. Right. And so you you start consuming it more. I, mean, I guess I shouldn't assume everybody is this way, but me personally, I just become more and more passive about it. So. <laughs> You just you you just hear Taylor Swift songs by Osmosis, and you're like, oh, those, those are catchy. What I'm gonna do after I hang up with you is I'm randomly gonna call Mama H up. Every time I go over there, she's got T Swift playing. I went to her show at Levi Stadium on the last tour, and I just saw, and it was great. But I just saw an ad that she's playing there again. I think in the next weekend or the weekend after. Would you Would you go again? Would I go again? No, I think that was one of those ones where you've seen it once, you've, you've seen it, and I don't need to see her play those songs again. The band that I just keep going back to, the band from when I was 19 years old, is Weezer. Mm, I'm, yeah. I saw them. There, there's a, I live five minutes from Shoreline Amphitheater in Mountain View. They played there two years ago when I went, and they're playing this summer, and I bought the tickets months ago, and it's, for people of my age, it's just like the perfect billing. It's them with the Pixies. That's a great one. I, I don't even know why the whether the Pixies should be the opening act or the or the headliner. I saw Weezer about two years ago here in in Bethlehem at Music Fest. And I came away a little underwhelmed. Well, you know, we're slightly different age and, and yeah. there was a study recently about it was pretty fascinating. I'll try to sum it up as quickly as I can. They used Spotify's data to figure out like, for instance, let's take the sweater song. Like, based on that study, the people who download that or listen to that, stream that song the most are people my age, people who were 19 in 1995. And then if you were to pick another song that was really popular in 2002, the people that download that the most are people who were 17, 18, 19 year olds, years old in that year. It's like your music taste kind of 
cement themselves forever around that age time. All right. Well, he is the front man of the All-American on the athletic family of websites. His name is Stuart Mandel. Also check out his podcast that he does with our friend Bruce Feldman. It's called The Audible. As always, really good stuff. And it's good to have you back on the show. It, it's been far too long. So wish you nothing but the best with the venture. Keep doing what you're doing. And we'll have to talk again soon. Thanks so much, Ty. I always enjoy coming on here. And uh, we'll talk again soon. All right. Again, that's Stuart Mandel. You can find him over on the All American as part of the Athletics Network of Great Sports websites. I mentioned at the end that I was going to call Mama H to talk about Taylor Swift. Let's let's actually give her a call here and see if she has anything controversial to say. Hello, Mom. Yes. You're on the. You're on, you're actually on the podcast. Okay. What are we talking about? Let's talk about Taylor Swift. <laughs> what would you like to talk about Taylor Swift? She hasn't been in the news much lately, although she'll be starting her reputation tour, I suppose, very soon. I need someone to talk to. I talked to Stuart Mandel. You know Stu. Okay. Yeah, I know who that is. Yeah. And he was telling me about a show. He went to see a Taylor Swift show at Levi's Stadium. Okay. Did he say which one it was? Which show? Yeah, like which album he went. To. I mean, uh, you I know, know, usually when I she think it was a tour. while. I think it was a couple of years ago. Oh, okay. What are your What are your top three songs off the new Taylor album? Off the new Taylor album, Reputation. Because if if we tried to power rank all of them, we'd be here forever. But. Everyone on the show, everyone who listens to the show knows that you're a pretty big Taylor Swift fan. <laughs> so we started talking Taylor Swift and it jogged my memory. I'm thinking I should call mom. So what are your top well, three top three songs off, off the of new the album? album? Yeah. Okay. I actually liked Reputation, the song. Okay. I liked Endgame because I like anything she does with Ed Sheeran. Okay. I'm writing these and down, by the e- way. And then it's either delicate or gorgeous. I don't know which one. You know, the uh, delicate um, video just kind of came out not too long ago, which was kind of intriguing. I haven't seen any of the videos, but Delicate's an underrated song. I'll give you that. Okay. Well, how about Gorgeous? I don't know that one. That one doesn't jog my mo- my memory. Well, in the very beginning of it, um, well, I-, I don't know. They just, they they say it's about her new boyfriend or whatever, you know, so. But, you know, I, I listen to them, and as I learn the words or whatever to them, I, I end up liking most of them. So, you know, and I think, though, they were saying that with the tour that she's going on now, like, you can you can pick out some of her songs that she's going back to some of her country roots. Like, when she started in the very beginning, one of her first albums, I think, I liked the story, the song Love Story, which was um, pretty popular. I think that was one of the songs in the very beginning that made her very famous you know well see now you're not a country music fan so this is like a natural dilemma she's not a twangy country person she never was okay i mean she definitely has her roots in country but there's i mean i I like listening to her i like keith urban i mean he's country too but he's not country country you know what i mean it's like you know they're not the cars aren't crashing and they're drinking their beer and whatever it's just it's a different kind of country. Right. And so, I, I mean, I like him. I like her. I like, um, you know, I mean, I'm not a big country fan. I'll be honest with you. But she, when she moved, like, you know, into pop and everything, I, I, I think that keeps her really fresh. You know, she's not staying stuck in one genre. You know, some people complained about that, but I actually, in, I, I enjoy her music. I don't know. So let's go here. Let's close out here. What are okay. you, what are you listening to lately? on on your speaker on Spotify. <laughs> You're not going to believe this, okay? Or maybe you will believe it. I don't know. I just I I saw the movie The Greatest Showman. I okay. love listening. Yeah, yeah, Hugh Jackman. I, yeah, I love listening to music that is from an original motion picture and I love the music um from I love the music from that and I could just keep listening to it over and over again. I'm always amazed at 
uh, Hugh Jackman's ability to do what he does. I mean, from the Wolverine to Les Mis to now this, P.T. Barnum. And, but the music is all original. I listen to that a lot. And I'll tell you what else I listen to. I love La La Land. And so when I'm, you know, when I'm working in the kitchen or cleaning or whatever, I'll, I'll, I'll ask my my I'll ask my Alexa to please play the music from certain motion pictures. And a lot of times, of course, it's the musicals, you know. Hmm. Okay. So I, I, I like that. I, I, I always like listening to Ed Sheeran, too. You know, I like his music. And uh, that would be me. All right, Mama. So are we are we signing off now? We're we're gonna sign off. I'll I, I'm sure I'll talk to you later. Okay. All right, hon. Thanks for calling. All right. Take care. You too. Bye bye. All right. There you have it. A little bit of a left turn, bringing Mama H into the show here. Hope everyone enjoyed it. Big thanks to Stuart Mandel again from the All American. Big thanks to Mama H for talking a little music. Big thanks to all of you for downloading the show. Don't forget, you can find us out on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and anywhere where fine podcasts are sold. Dan and I have a bunch going down over the next couple months or so, so please make sure you keep in touch. Subscribe to our newsletter, which you can find out on solidverbal.com. Yeah, a lot going down here over the next couple months. Dan will be back next week. promise it'll be both of us next week talking more college football. In the meantime, my name is Ty Hildenbrandt. For Dan Rubenstein, wherever he may be in parts unknown, stay solid. Catch you next week.